So, okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural Microsoft Database Lecture Series. So today we have uh, Sudipta and Gupta from uh, Microsoft Research uh, talking to us. So uh, Sudipta has done a bunch of work in data center networking and also um, data storage engines. And today is going to tell us a, about a new key value store. Take it away. Okay. Thank you, Alvin, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about uh, the BW3 key value store and uh, our journey from research to production at uh, Microsoft. Uh, this is joint work with my colleagues uh, Justin Lewandowski and David Lomé at MSR and also uh, with my colleagues uh, in Microsoft product groups across SQL Server, Azure Document DB and Bing Object Store. Uh, this is a project we started around early uh, 2011 and over the last couple of years uh, the some of the tech transfers I will talk about towards the end have also come to fruition so let me begin with that so many of you will be familiar with the B3 uh, it's probably uh, at least 40 years old dating back to the 1970s uh, it's, it provides uh, key ordered access to records. I, uh, it has a tree structure which I have tried to illustrate here. Uh, there are uh, the index nodes or the non-leaf nodes which contain separator keys to guide the search and pointers to child nodes and the actual data, the records are in the leaf nodes. It provides efficient point lookups as well as range lookups. So you can do scans on the key space. Uh, so it's a sorted index, unlike a hash table based index, which, with which you cannot do scans efficiently. And uh, this has, has a balanced tree structure where all the leaves are at the same level, the lowermost level, and the balance is maintained uh, using page split and merge mechanisms. So you might ask, you know, because the B3 is 40 years old, why are we revisiting it? What has changed? Uh, why is it interesting anymore? And the answer to that is that hardware has changed uh, over the last 40 years, big time. And uh, um, a lot of the B3 implementations, they uh, are optimized for you know, old hardware, uh, single core CPUs, uh, hard disks, uh, uh, you know, very little main memory and so on. So we observe that multiple aspects of this hardware has changed over uh, the last 10 years and there is an opportunity to revisit the classical B3 and, and take a shot to optimize for much better performance. So, so that is the uh, tenet, the thesis of this talk and this project. Uh, so, as I talk about the, the main design principles for the BW3, uh, you know, some of the hardware aspects will become clear. The first one is that our CPUs today are multi-core and uh, uh, you know, any key value store, any database you build needs to support high levels of concurrency. Uh, uh, so, in order to exploit these modern multi-core processors, uh, it helps to take a lock-free approach. Uh, now, the term lock, you know, as I use it here, is like a mutex or a reader-writer lock. In the database uh, world, it's often called a latch to differentiate from transactional locking for concurrency control. So, for much of the talk, lock means a latch or like OS mutex. So the second aspect is storage, right? Uh, we have uh, optimized our storage stack for decades to reduce seeks on hard disk, which are expensive, order of 10 milliseconds. The equation changes with these flash SSDs, uh, which emerged you know, uh, towards the later half, the end of the previous decade. Uh, the reads are very, very fast, uh, you know, order of uh, 10 to 100 microseconds. Uh, the random writes are not so efficient on these devices because they are copy on write devices. When you update a page in place, 
It does not update in place as in hard disk. It makes a fresh copy of the page together with your edits and the old page becomes garbage on the device and it is garbage collected inside the device and the change in the location of the page inside the device is abstracted away using a flash translation layer or FTL inside the SSD. So the OS doesn't get to see the interface to the OS remains similar, uh, the logical block address interface. But uh, the, CPU, uh, the, the CPU inside the SSD, they have to spend cycles and IOs to do garbage collection as your storage fills up and that interferes with your primary workload. So it's not a good idea to do lots of random writes on these devices. Uh, so we want to organize our storage in a log structured manner and that's not what classical B trees do. Uh, so in keeping with this log structure theme, we also do delta updates to pages. We try to not do in place updates as much as possible uh, and, and that also helps uh, in, the, in the cache architecture of today's processors. It reduces the cache invalidation in the memory hierarchy because uh, the same copy of the data may be in the L1 caches of the other cores and if you don't touch it, you don't invalidate the copy in the other cores. And uh, it also reduces garbage creation and write amplification on flash. Uh, so we can run with good performance on really commodity SSDs because we don't need any sophisticated garbage cleaning functionality that some of the higher end enterprise class SSDs have and they are also much more expensive. Okay, so with that let me uh, uh, introduce the BW3 architecture. Uh, we have three layers. The topmost layer is the access method layer, which encodes the B3 data structure logic. Uh, it uh, assumes that the pages are in memory. So whenever it needs to work on a page, it will request a page from the lower layer, and it will get back a page. It will be in memory, and it can do whatever it wants from a data structure logic point of view. The middle tier, that's the cache layer, that provides this logical page abstraction which the B3 layer expects. And the cache layer is responsible for moving pages between memory and flash as necessary. And finally, the, the storage layer, the bottommost layer, does the actual reads and writes from storage, and it also does storage management. In our case, the lock structured storage management. What we noticed that the cache and flash layer together uh, provide sufficiently general functionality that may be uh, needed by different access methods. So we combine them into a layer we call LAMA, lat free log structured access method aware. So tomorrow if you want to write some new access method on, on top of LAMA, say a hash table, you can reuse lot of the thinking that went into the design of the BW3 by programming on top of LAMA, which uh, exposes a latch free log structured uh, page engine, page storage engine. So uh, the talk is uh, roughly divided into these three layers. I'll talk a little bit about each and then the end I will talk about uh, uh, some of the technology transfers. So one of the central abstractions uh, is the mapping table in BW3. So let me talk a little bit about that and then some of the other things will be easier to explain. So the, the B3 layer sees a logical page. Uh, we abstract away, we hide the actual locations of these pages because a page can be either on RAM in memory or flash and even when it's in memory its location can change because we do this delta updating which I will talk about in a moment. So the mapping table uh, exposes this logical page abstraction and translates a logical page ID to a physical address. Now it also helps to isolate updates to a single page. Uh, if you see the B3 diagram here there are pointers from parent pages to child pages. These pointers use logical page IDs and that is providing 
uh, the ID to location separation. If uh, I update a leaf page, its location changes, I don't have to do updates all the way to the root because the inter-page pointers use logical IDs. So that gives us this ID and location separation. It is also the central data structure used for multi-thread concurrency control. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Now, for those of you who are familiar with log structure storage systems, uh, they use a separate mapping table because as you update pages, the location of the page on storage moves. We don't need a separate mapping table for a log structure store. We use the same mapping table. And because, as I said, we don't have locks or latches, so we do all updates using compare and swap. This is an atomic instruction uh, available in uh, almost all hardware architectures. Uh, you know, the different flavors of it. The one on x86 is compare and swap, where uh, you compare the current value with a value you provide, which you have possibly read earlier. And if it's the same, then you swap it with the new value and this entire sequence of steps is atomic. It happens or it doesn't happen. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to structure the presentation uh, by comparing each aspect of the BW tree with the classical B tree, and that will bring out some of the innovations. So the first slide around this comparison uh, is around the concurrent page updates, the, the log-free aspect. So in a classical B tree, here is a page P, and suppose a, a, a insert record operation comes along on, on a thread, what will it do? It will take a write lock on the page. Uh, now at this point, after it's taken the write lock, other accesses to the page, readers or writers, have to block. Now this blocking is, is not desirable, especially in a multi-tenant cloud environment, because if the thread blocks, it's taken out of the thread pool. You know, it cannot do anything else. Uh, so this is not desirable. Uh, then the thread will update the page in place. So if there was a copy of the page in the uh, L1 cache of other cores, those will get invalidated. Uh, so that reduces your cache efficiency if the page was accessed from concurrently from other cores. And it, uh, finally, it will release the lock on the page. Okay. Now what happens in the BW tree world? Now, there is this mapping table which is pointing to the page. Now, suppose we want to insert record 50. Okay. So 50 is the key, suppose. We, we will prepare a delta record which will describe what is the update to the page, okay? and we will link it to the page. Now at this point, accessors to the page are still seeing the old page, right? because the pointer from the mapping table is here. Then we will install the new mapping uh, in the mapping table for this page, so that subsequent accessors to the page start from this delta record and traverse down, and hence they will see the update. Uh, so you can see you are preserving the copy of the base page in the caches of other cores. It's not an in-place update. And similarly, you can do deletions and so on. Now, how does this uh, help in concurrency control? So let's take a scenario where two threads are coming, the yellow and the blue thread. Uh, and each of them you know, want to do uh, two different things to the page. What will they do? They will each read the current mapping table and figure out that the purple delta record is the beginning of the page. So they will prepare their own delta records to point to the purple. Again, note at this point, uh, neither of these records are visible to uh, current accessors to the page. They will start from the purple record. Now each of them will try to install their update using a compare and swap on the mapping table this particular entry, and one of them will win because it's an atomic operation. <coughs> and let's say in this case, the yellow thread wins. So now the insertion of the yellow delta record to the page has succeeded. The blue thread knows that its insert failed, it will retry. So while all this is happening, readers can come to the page, access the page, there is no blocking. and if you just happen to get unlucky to be a concurrent writer, you would have to uh, 
uh, retry the operation. And uh, retrying the operation is, is kind of you know, standard paradigm in log free data structures. You know you, know you fail, you retry. Uh, so another point to note here is as, as you keep appending these delta records, your lookup performance will, will suffer, right? Because you have a chain of delta records accumulating on the page. So periodically, uh, accessors to the page when they come in, you know, based on some configurable th thresholds, they will uh, uh, compact, consolidate all these delta records into the base page and create an efficient consolidated representation. And that is also installed using the same compare and swap operation. I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you clarify how this works with uh, the concurrency control at the level of the transactions, where certain transactions should see the reads of other transactions? Yes. So, so that we, I'll, I'll cover at the end in terms of layering a transactional component on top. So, this is an atomic record store. It, it, it does not know about uh, races, you know, at the transaction level. So, uh, so here I'm. Uh, what I covered is concurrent updates to the page and consolidating a page. There are a couple of other things which have, you have to do in a B tree, like page split and page merge, and they are non-trivial to do in a log-free manner. I'll skip over that. It's uh, in the paper, and happy to discuss that offline. Uh, uh, this work appeared in ICD 2013. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go to the cache and storage layer. But but I think you got some flavor of what log free means uh, on did this you, slide. Did you say the consolidation was all log free also? Yes, yes. You prepared the the consolidated representation and you install it using compare and swap. If you fail, it's fine. The next accessor can try it. Okay, so uh, so let me come to uh, SSDs. So now, these started emerging in servers around 2008, 2009. Uh, we uh, looked at one of the really high-end enterprise drives. This is a Fusion IO SSD over PCIe. You know, they charge a lot for it. Uh, prices have come down, but at any given point, there is a big gap between these price gap between these high-end enterprise drives and your consumer-grade uh, commodity drives. So uh, we ran IO meter doing 4KB read and write IOs. And you can see here it uh, fulfills the promise of a random access device. The sequential reads and random reads about the same performance in terms of IOPS. But the sequential writes, the, the IOPS is significantly higher than that of random writes. And I average these numbers over a one hour run if I keep running, this gap will widen because you get a lot of garbage accumulation in the device, and the garbage has to, uh, the device has to do GC inside, and it slows down the performance uh, of the device. So the solution here is to use Flash in a log structured manner. So how does uh, the page structure look? So uh, some of the benefits of log structure storage you know, are known you know, going back to the LFS paper uh, in the 1990s. Uh, you amortize the cost of writes over many page updates and the techniques are also beneficial to hard disks, not just with flash. But what happens with uh, uh, flash, uh, with uh, log structure storage is the read fragmentation increases, right? So here I'm showing you the layout of the pages on Flash. So if you look at the diagram two slides back, I've drawn it upside down. The base page uh, would have been flush to Flash earliest. So here is the oldest part of the log. Here is the newest part of the log. We are going uh, top to bottom in time order. So uh, the base page is here as the Delta Records came they got flushed and they point backwards to the base page, right? So the, the, the page delta record in memory on storage, it goes backward. And you have the mapping table, and when the page is not in memory, the mapping table contains the start offset of the chain on flash. So how do we update the page? You know, if a new delta record comes, we append it to the end of the log, it points to the previous 
delta record in the chain and we update the flash pointer to point to the beginning of the chain. So can you um, explain to us, um, is there SSD organized also in blocks? Uh, and if so, then um, aren't the delta records um, misutilizing the, the, the block because they're much more? Yes, so I, this uh, diagram I'm showing from a you know, logical point of view, we don't write a delta record granularity. We write in much bigger granularity. I'm coming to that on the next slide. But, but an important point that uh, Dan brings out here, uh, there is a separation of physical page on device and logical page in the data structure. In your classical B tree, they are one and the same. Here there is separation. Your logical pages, uh, fragments of a single logical page can be spread all over the log and it has no relationship to the physical page size on flash. And that's the uh, intentional part of, of, of the design. Uh, um, so I think your point also on this slide. So this is the second comparison slide with the classical B tree to bring out the storage innovation. So let's go back to a classical B tree. The storage is organized into fixed size pages, you know, typically 8 kilobytes, and each of these pages correspond to the logical data structure page uh, that the B tree uses. And when you want to read a page, you fetch it into RAM, you do your updates in place, and when the time comes to flush, you write it back to flash or disk, and that's a random write. So we have workloads where there is very little locality uh, across uh, in the key space. So you can uh, see that if your buffer pool space is small, which is often true in cloud scenarios with multi-tenancy, you have to be very resource frugal. You will do these random writes all over the place, which is very inefficient on hard disk because of seek, and it is inefficient on flash because you are doing write amplification, creating garbage on flash. So what do we do in BW3 world? Here uh, I've shown you a page on flash. Uh, this is the page. This has a base page and a delta record, and mapping table is pointing to it. Uh, so when we have to access the page, we bring it into memory. This is how it looks. Then we update the page by appending a delta record. Now suppose the time comes to flush the page. We have some metadata records here which I haven't shown, uh, just for you know simplicity. From that we can figure out what is the unflushed portion of the page with respect to flash. In this case, it is the dark gray record. So when the time comes to flush, we will copy that unflushed portion of the page into a large flush buffer. Uh, we call this incremental page flushing. Okay. Now these flush buffers are order of megabytes because we want to amortize the cost of writes appends to storage. And typically they would contain 1000 to 10,000 page flushes. So the previous diagram was oversimplified. These small delta records are not directly going to storage as per Dan's point. They are going via flush buffers and the writes are being amortized in the flush buffer. And so when this flush buffer is full, by the way, this flush buffer is also maintained in a log-free manner. Uh, to write to the flush buffer, you reserve space using log-free mechanisms, then you copy. Uh, there is no locking involved. Uh, so when this flush buffer is full, it is appended to the end of the log using a single write IO. So you know all these order of thousand to ten thousand edits to a page across many pages are getting amortized to a single write IO to the end of the log, and this is where the efficiency of log structuring comes in. And another point to note with classical log structuring, uh, if you go back to the LFS paper from Berkeley, if you update even one byte on the page, the whole page is flushed. But we have this delta record mechanism where we can do incremental updates to pages and only flush the changed portion of the page, not the whole page. Okay. So that's another difference. Here. So when do you consider the right to be durable in this case? Uh, when the act, the act comes back uh, from the uh, the append to the log. Now, I think your question is from transactional durability point of view. So, I will cover that in the end. It is possible that 
So when the transaction is logged in the right ahead log of the transactional component, the act goes back to the user, right? So it is possible that the update is in the flush buffer or maybe it's here, it's not even been flushed. So then if a power loss happens, we lose that in the data component, in the BW tree. But on recovery, we will have to replay the log and uh, bring it back into the BW tree. Uh, the point here is BW tree is providing durability at larger granularities for write efficiency. If we lose data in between from a transactional point of view, it will be in the write ahead log because the end user rack for the transaction durability goes after the, the changes are stable, the operations are stable in the right ahead log. I see, but otherwise, so, I'm, so the way that so, I should think about this is if I'm using this as purely a storage mechanism, not yes, a database, right? Yes. So then basically that means until the data has been flushed. Yeah. Yes, so, so there is a way to provide uh, checkpoint calls to BW3, but if you make those calls too frequently, we would have to flush before the flush buffer gets full and that would not make the best use of storage throughput. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so it's possible to use it in different modes and get different levels of performance. Okay, uh, so one of the issues with log structuring that's fundamental is page fragmentation, you know, because now your page fragments will be spread across different parts of the log. So the penalty here is reduced compared to hard disk because to read multiple fragments of the page, you do random reads on flash, which are way faster than random reads on hard disk. So this is where we are more tolerant of fragmentation because we can uh, fall back and exploit the, the excellent random uh, read speed of uh, flash SSDs. Now on top of that, we have another optimization. When we are flushing multiple delta records from a page, we, we can group them into a contiguous delta called a C delta so that to read this page back from flash, we don't need four IOs, we need two IOs because these three are packed into one unit. That's an optimization. There's also details of garbage collection which I will skip, I'll come back if there is time. Okay, okay now the cache layer. Uh, uh, the cache layer, as I said, is responsible for moving pages back and forth from memory to storage. So it reads pages uh, into RAM from stable storage and it also flushes pages to stable storage uh, via the flush buffers. Uh, it also does the page swap out functionality. The BW3 operates uh, on a configurable uh, memory budget. So to adhere to that memory budget, you have to swap out pages into storage and the page swap out functionality does not run in the background. In this case, it runs in the foreground and it's parallelized across the accessor threads. So the threads coming in to make operation calls on the BW tree, you know, insert, update, delete, they do some small portion of page swap out work if needed, if there is buffer pool pressure. So as uh, more threads are hitting BW3, the page swap out work naturally scales because it is divided across the, the threads uh, for parallelism. Okay. Uh, let me talk a little bit about checkpointing and recovery because there were some questions around that. Uh, uh, so there are two levels of checkpointing going on. So one is the B3 layer checkpoint checkpointing. So look at the app layer sending uh, inserts, updates, deletes to the BW tree. They are not immediately durable, right? The delta records could remain in memory, they have not been flushed, or if they have been flushed, they are still in the flush buffer, they haven't reached storage. So if you want durability so that you can bring, um, shut down the BW tree, uh, you know, bring it back up later and see those same record updates which you did, you have to uh, do this checkpointing. And that essentially flushes pages to flush buffer and subsequently to storage. And our operations have LSNs, log sequence numbers, uh, which the BW3 understands. So you can say that flush up to this LSN uh, for a durability guarantee. Now there is also checkpointing going on in the Llama layer for fast recovery. So suppose we did not have this second checkpointing, then everything is durable. 
but to bring up the VW3 you would have to scan the whole log and that may take longer than what you are willing to tolerate from a latency point of view. You are not losing data because you checkpointed but it takes a while to bring up the VW3. So the LAMA checkpointing is for fast recovery. What we do is during LAMA checkpointing we write the mapping table to flash. So remember that some of these offsets in the mapping table may be memory pointers because the page is in RAM and some may be flash pointers. For the ones which are in memory we go and traverse the page and there are flush delta records which I haven't talked about from those we can find out what is the flash address of the page that's the thing we store in the mapping table because memory pointers are useless to store on storage you know memory locations will change when the tree comes back up. Uh, and then uh, we record the right position in the log when the checkpoint started, okay. Uh, so where the next right point is in the log. So this is a fuzzy checkpoint. As I am scanning the mapping table and taking a checkpoint, the tree is alive, updates are coming, mapping table is changing, that's fine because what we will do during recovery, we will scan the end of the log which grew since the checkpoint started and that will bring the mapping table back to a consistent uh, value or snapshot. So that's what I have ex tried to explain on this slide. So what do we do during recovery? So the recovery uh, creates check, uh, the checkpointing creates checkpoint files uh, and we alternate between two fixed regions on flash and you know, that's standard. So let's see how recovery works. First thing we will do, we'll restore the mapping table from the latest checkpoint region. Uh, remember this is a fuzzy checkpoint. So this mapping table is not a snapshot at any single point in time because while we were saving it, things were changing. So what we would have to do is, we would have to scan from the lock position that we recorded in the checkpoint just before we started the checkpoint and we will scan the log and bring the mapping table up to speed and when we are done we can be sure that the mapping table is up to date with what is there in the log and when we bring up the BW tree, and tree in this manner it is, it is a cold tree all the pages are on flash and the mapping table contains all flash offsets nothing is in memory right uh, and then we have to also restore the BW3 root LPID because without that we cannot start traversing. Now at this point it is a, it is a correctly recovered tree from you know serving requests data point of view but it is cold and so you have the traditional problem that you know the first few operations uh, you know will bring pages back into the cache they will be slow and so on so we have some optimizations for fast cache warm up. We can bring up all the non leaf pages or the index pages into memory using sequential IOs. Uh, so we get a warm tree from the internal nodes point of view uh, but, but not from the leaf point of view because typically you know uh, the tree could be very very large and the internal nodes are just 1% of or less of the tree. So you can afford to bring in the internal nodes, the leaf nodes you have to bring in based on access patterns, right. So you can do some optimization for having a partially warm tree, okay. Now there was a question about transactions that came up. So BW3 is part of the larger deuteronomy project uh, at MSR uh, and one of the uh, design principles of that project is the separation of data component and transactional component. What you see in today's databases and in lot of uh, textbook material, the transactional and the data component are intertwined. You, know, uh, uh, you hold locks, transactional level locks on the pages in the B tree. You do B tree uh, structure modifications, they are logged in the right ahead log. It doesn't make sense because you know one is related to transaction, other is related to integrity of the stored data. So Deuteronomy does this separation <coughs> in a cleanly layered fashion so that uh, you can layer a transactional component on top of, of a data component as long as both of them obey some protocol handshake. Uh, 
which is outlined in the CIDR uh, 2009 paper. That's the first paper uh, introducing the deuteronomy architecture. Uh, so not only is there layering across transactional and data component, there's also layering inside the data component, as I talked about in the second slide. Uh, on the bottom most layer is the, the LAMA, latch-free lock structured page storage engine. And on top of that, you can build a access method. We have built BW3, tomorrow, you know, somebody else can build a linear hashing data structure and so on. So you can see there is a clean layering across multiple levels of the stack and that allows this uh, library to be used in different ways based on application requirements. If somebody wants a transactional key value store, you know, he will write code that will, that will hit APIs on top of the transactional component. If you want to use it as an atomic key value store, that's what BW3 is, you will hit APIs on top of the data component. Tomorrow, if you want to build a new access method and you want to reuse the, the plumbing that went in to make it lock-free, lock-structured, then you can hook into the APIs on top of Llama, which will expose a page storage engine. So that's the flexibility in using different uh, parts of this layered stack. But you don't allow, are you planning to allow like interactions between these different applications or are you imagining that they will be completely separate? They will use separate instances of this okay. stack. So you are using the code separate instances. Okay. okay, so then, it, so now in the context of the deuteronomy architecture, we can talk about end-to-end -end recovery and that was Alvin's question. Uh, uh, so what you would want to do is first bring up the data component and I talked about BW3 recovery. Uh, but there is a possibility that that does not have all the data that is supposed to be durable because when the, there was a crash and data was either not flushed or in volatile flush buffers. So that's where the transactional component recovery comes in. You have to replay the log uh, from the uh, the redo start point and uh, it helps to recover the unflushed data at DC up to the end of stable log and there are uh, well-defined handshakes between the TC and the DC as part of the deuteronomy architecture which make this work correctly. Uh, so the order of recovery is DC recovery first and then uh, TC recovery uh, to replay the log. So I have about uh, 10, 15 minutes. So let me go, go to the production uh, story. So we started this project in early 2011 and over the last couple of years um, we have had uh, three major tech transfers to uh, different product groups at Microsoft and I'll talk a little bit about them. The first one is the, the key sequential index in SQL Server Hackathon. As you know, uh, Hackathon is the main memory database engine in SQL Server. It's part of SQL Server. It's not a separate main memory engine. Uh, uh, so you can, you know, you can declare your tables to be main memory resident and Hackathon will be used for that. It's lock free for high concurrency. So uh, the underlying point lookup data structure in Hackathon, uh, it's hash tables, that's lock free or latch free. The transactional mechanism uses MVCC, so it's lock free in a transactional sense. But your hash table based data structures don't give you range, uh, efficient uh, range query. So that's why BW3 comes in. It is used for uh, range scans uh, in Hackathon. And it's lock free, uh, conforming to the overall latch and lock free architecture. The second uh, tech transfer is the indexing engine in Azure Document DB. So, Document DB is a document oriented store. I'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, document oriented stores have to support rich query processing over schema free documents. These could be XML documents, JSON documents. And an important feature that would be good to have is automatic indexing. So, you want to do rich expressive queries on paths in the document. Each document is a tree containing a, you know, a hierarchy of properties and values. 
Compare this to the relational model where you specify secondary indexes on explicitly on columns, right? So that's kind of non-automatic indexing. Uh, so here you would like to ingest your documents and then you can do rich expressive queries and they should work, you know, reasonably fast. Uh, and uh, you want this indexing to keep up with document ingestion. So not only is your index size bigger because you have to index these paths and sub paths in the tree per document, you also have to keep up with sustained document ingestion. For example, you, you, the documents could be IOT log files, click, uh, you know, click streams and so on. So it's very important for the indexing to keep up with uh, document ingestion to serve fresh results when the queries come. Okay. Uh, th so BW3 is the indexing engine inside DocumentDB. I'll talk about this in more detail because uh, among the three tech transfers, uh, this is an example where because of the collaboration, we were driven to add new features to BW3. Uh, and I'll talk about those features also. Yes. So, so what are you indexing in DocumentDB? Is it the paths or is it the actual values? The, the paths and subparts okay. uh, of the tree. Uh, was it subparts? Sub subparts sub could be sequences of three nodes and the three contiguous nodes. You can't index everything because it would blow up. So you have to index, you know, some reasonable number of terms per document. Yes. Do you do that trick of inverting the paths. You can have the uh, leaf. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. The third uh, tech transfer is, is, is the sorted key value store in Bing object store. So that's a, a backend property in Bing and it is storing lot of the other data other than the search index. The web search index is separate, it's highly optimized for web search and so on, but there are a lot of other things in Bing uh, which are stored in object store and previously object store did not have range query support. Uh, it used a hash table based index, uh, which is also SST optimized, came out of MSR, uh, but it didn't have range query support. So BW3 uh, provides uh, range query support to object store. Okay. So this is also, this slide brings out the different ways in which MSR engages with product groups. So the first one in SQL Server Hackathon, you know, we gave the hackathon team the paper and a prototype you know they rewrote the code from scratch to you know for to conform to the coding standards of the rest of hackathon in document db case we wrote the code from scratch uh, you know working with the document db team because what we had to begin with was uh, you know the research prototype so by the time we reached here you know they are like three, four code bases going around and we are being asked to fix bugs in multiple code bases, you know, we are going crazy. So what we did for object store, uh, you know, we got some of the fixes from doc, from document DB back into our original research code base and we iterated to bring it up to, you know, production quality. So now the Bing object store and our research prototype code base is one and the same and we are building on top. Uh, so that we can, you know, manage and fix bugs on one code base and, you know, uh, sleep and get some sanity in our lives. So, so uh, a uh, you know, quick description of the evolution of data stores over time. You know, we are all familiar with the relational model. You know, SQL Server, Oracle, Amazon RDS, uh, SQL Azure, so on. Fully schematized relational queries and transactions. Then as part of the NoSQL movement, we have these key value stores or column family stores. You know, the, the value is a single item or there could be multiple columns. You know, example, Azure tables, uh, Cassandra, level DB. In the document store model, each document is roughly corresponds to an entity in the relational model, but it can have a rich hierarchy of properties and values. So here is an example. This is a company with location, which one is the main location, the exports and so on. You can see here. And you want to do rich expressive hierarchy, hierarchical queries on this rich structure of each document. So indexing is a challenge because uh, 
if you don't index, your queries will be very, very inefficient. You have to look up every document, right? Uh, so that's uh, relating to what Dan had asked. Um, so the value proposition of VW tree for document DB is consistent indexing uh, to uh, keep up with uh, high volume of document ingestion. You have to index uh, in real time. Uh, when you send the document ingestion act to the user, the index should have been up to date. Okay, that's the challenge here. So uh, this requirement uh, drove us in new directions for BW tree, and that is why I want to highlight this tech transfer. Uh, so we are storing an inverted index in the, in BW tree, right? Uh, inverted index as in the from the information retrieval wall. You have terms in the document, which are individual terms or collection of paths, uh, concatenation of nodes on a path, and you are storing the mapping from the term to the uh, set of documents that this term is contained in, so that if you receive a query on term T, you can look up just these three documents, not the entire corpus. And this is, uh, you know, at a high level search indexes also build this inverted index. But it's way more optimized uh, for search context where the data may not be changing as fast. Now, this is the third slide where I will bring out uh, the innovation again by comparing with classical B tree. Okay, so what would happen if I stored this inverted mapping in a classical B tree? Uh, this would be a record. Let's say it is stored on this page, which is currently on storage, and I am having a document ingestion scenario where a new document D4 comes in. That's the plus addition containing the term T. Then I would read the page, I would do a modification, I would have to write it back uh, because I have very little locality on the workload, so and buffer pool size is small, so there is a read IO and there is a random write IO, right? This is the classical B tree. In BW tree, I have shown the same mapping on a page on SSD, and what we are holding in memory is a slim page stub pointing to where the page is on memory, uh, on storage, and we have some more metadata in the page to help us uh, do the search, the separator keys, uh, uh, billing site pointers, and so on. So now, when uh, this document D4 comes in containing the term T, we don't read this page. We add a delta record to the page stub describing the update to the page without actually knowing what the current value of t is. And this is called a blind update because updating it does not require you to know the current value. And this is suited to an inverted index situation because the document D4 came in. Why would you need to know the current mapping? You just want to bring the index up to date with the new mapping. Similarly, you can do document deletion. Say document D2 contains the term t and the minus here shows the deletion. Uh, I want to delete the term T. Uh, so instead of you know looking at this, I can just append the delta record uh, de describing the deletion. Okay. So so my documents have come in or got deleted, and I did not do any read IOs. And the write IOs are efficient, right? Because when this page gets flushed, these will get copied into the flush buffer and single IO write IO to the end of the log. Yes. So you're assuming that the the deletion, for instance, does not need to check for prior existence of the record. Yes, because there is a separate uh, document store which will do that check or maybe the user transaction is already reading that document. Uh, so we assume that. Now it is possible that it is possible to function without doing this check. If this thing is wrong, we can figure it out later. When we merge, we will figure out the, the discrepancy and, and we will ignore this deletion. It's possible to do that. Uh, so what happens when a lookup comes on T? You have to do the read, right? Because you cannot avoid uh, reading this. So we will co collect the multiple fragments of the page on flash, which may involve multiple read IOs. We probably find because it's fast random reads. Now you have to c combine them. 
now the bw tree is a generic store it knows nothing about the data formats it's opaque so how do you combine so we expose a merge function to the user of the bw tree he has to write his own merge function because he understands his payload formats right so this keeps the bw tree generic it is not dependent on the particular application so the user writes his merge function the bw tree internal code feeds the fragments to the merge function the merge function creates a consolidated format in this case d2 got deleted so going back to alvin's question if d2 wasn't here uh, you know i can either hold it out here or i can figure out there was some error somewhere you know do some generate some alert and ignore it so there is a sanity check happening when the merge function is called and then you output the merged value to the user okay now this we also need to call the merge function when we consolidate the page because we collect these fragments together and compact it into the base page right and we don't know what the merge function is we define the api the user has to implement it okay we are opaque to the payload format okay uh, finally the second i uh, think i'll finish in 5 minutes uh, the finally the second direction in which uh, the document ev collaboration uh, pushed us is resource governance in a multi tenant setting so in a multi tenant setting you know in document ev order of 100 replicas are running on the same machine and they have to be tightly resource governed if one replica takes up too much resources it will interfere with the performance of the other replicas and this is not desirable in a multi tenant setting um, uh, so we do different types of resource governance uh, in the first uh, the first resource is cpu right you have to uh, one replica cannot take up too much of cpu so we have uh, the threads calling into bw tree they do not block so that really helps they do not block because they don't take logs and they also do not block on io they do asynchronous io with continuation pattern and the top level scheduler will control the thread budget per replica okay the memory resource governance i talked about a little bit we can uh, there's a buffer pool limit we can stick to that and we can swap pages out and the, the buffer pool limit can be changed dynamically you know if you are decreasing it there will be some small time interval Uh, before which it falls below the decreased value we also do iops resource governance we operate on you know on these ssds which have some advertised iops uh, budget you know the sata ssds maybe several tens of thousands read iops you know under 10000 write iops you have to each replica has to stay within the iops budget uh, the we actually not too much constrained by write iops because they are very large we are more constrained by read iops uh, so the mechanism we have here we check the resource usage before issuing the io we do some averaging over small time intervals like token bucket and then uh, if uh, we are running close to the budget for that replica we ask that thread to retry after a computed time interval so it will get back to a job queue and then it will be retried and we also compute a hotness metric for the replica which is propagated upstream because the, if the, the when the throttling happens the further upstream it happens closer to the user it's better because uh, you will have fewer queues building up inside the system so we propagate feedback upstream to the upper layers we propagate it back up and and you know the if a replica gets really really hot at some point uh the throttling signal may go to the user client library we also do storage resource governance where you know it's a lock structured store so you have to do garbage collection uh, the interesting thing is here you know sometimes a lot of data may be deleted from the bw tree so you would have to shrink the lock structured store uh, accordingly because uh, at you know at the higher layer they expect that your storage usage from bw tree is roughly proportional to the amount of data stored in it right uh, so you know typical log structured storage systems work with a max size right and they when they get to 80 90% of max they do gc and so on 
but we are fully elastic. If you delete data, uh, you know, after some time we will shrink. Uh, we will remain proportional to the amount of logical data stored in BW3. Okay, uh, this is the second last slide. And I want to uh, bring back the fast recovery aspect I talked about. You know, in document DB, we are running in a replicated environment. There is a primary, there are two or more secondaries. And it is an important requirement in the cloud to bring up replicas quickly. Because, you know, replicas are going down, failing, or there is maintenance of the ring happening. Machines are, are getting upgraded, apps are getting um, patched and so on. So you want to bring down a replica and bring up another quickly on another machine. So the fast recovery feature of BW3 makes it suitable for bringing up a replica very quickly. Uh, what happens here, when we bring up a replica, the first thing we do, we get uh, the physical state stream from primary. It's not logical, it's physical. So the, the llama log in the primary is streamed to the secondary. Uh, so that includes a checkpoint file and the valid portion of the log between the GC and the write point. Now with those two pieces of information, the tree can be brought up very, very quickly as I talked about fast recovery. And after that, you still have to do a small amount of uh, catch up with the primary where you play the, the operations that you missed in a logical manner uh, and then you can this replica can join the, uh, the set of replicas for uh, that particular partition. Okay. Should probably stop because we're getting kicked out of the room. Okay, so this is the last slide. So, so let me quickly summarize. Uh, I, uh, we talked about how we redesigned the classical B tree from ground up for modern hardware and cloud. Uh, uh, some of the aspects lock free for high concurrency on modern multi core processors. Delta updating of pages for cache efficiency, efficiency, a lock structure storage organization for flash SSDs. Uh, we talked about flexible resource governance in a multi-tenant cloud setting. And uh, as part of the autonomy architecture, we can layer a transactional component on top. Uh, the BW3 is shipping in Microsoft's three server and cloud offerings, SQL Server Hackathon, Azure Document DB and being object store and some of the continuing work we have layered a transactional component on top of deuteronomy uh, on top of the bw3 as part of the deuteronomy architecture uh, it uses mbcc based mechanisms um, uh, we are currently looking at some b3 layer optimizations around page layout binary search prefix compression and range scans and there is also uh, some talk about open sourcing the database. There's a lot of interest from outside. Uh, so, great, thank you. Thank you for your attention. So, thanks everyone. So, we're going to continue in the database now with the discussion. Thanks.